is great. So if this happens to anybody and your does not record your grade, please take a picture of your, your final of your your grade from their quiz or exam and so I can input it. All right, let's uh one more thing I need to talk about. All right. All right, so tonight's soft tissues. Um it's not, I mean, not that bad. It's a pretty easy chapter. Um of what we need to do for soft tissue injuries, we'll talk about uh, different types of wounds, uh, a little bit of wound management, uh, electrical, chemical, and thermal burn. Uh, there are some pretty nasty pictures in this chapter. Um, I don't know if y'all happened to look at the slides, so be cautious if you have an easy stomach. Uh, and then we'll talk about chemicals in the eye and on the skin. Um, what types of wounds do we have? We have avulsion, uh, bite wounds, lacerations. I didn't sleep for crap last night, so that's why I'm sleepy. I'm sorry. Puncture wounds and incisions. Uh, we'll dive off into some of that. We'll go into a little bit deeper in others. So the biggest part of a lead burns, um, you need to know what type of burns, uh, electrical, chemical, thermal, or radiation. Uh, and then you will talk a, a tad bit about crust syndrome. Uh, it's not a whole lot in here about that. Um, so soft tissue roll, uh, injuries are common. Uh, they can be serious and life-threatening, depend on where they're at throughout the body um, and what type of, what organs are affected. Uh, don't become distracted just by the dramatic open wounds. I mean, if it looks bad, like you're gonna see a couple pictures in here in a little bit, don't let it pause you from what needs to be done. Uh, I mean, there's times in my career that I'm like, oh my God, what is that? I, you, you want me to do something with that? I, well, and then I've had to catch myself and kind of get back into things and uh, go from there. But it's, it's better off if you don't allow it to distract you. It's, it's a little bit safer. I say that, but we always have those instances. Uh, soft tissues of the body can be injured through blunt injury. We talked about that penetrating, barrel trauma, and burns. Um, soft tissue, some of the wound. Uh, wound care is one of the most frequent performed procedures in emergency departments throughout the United States. Most of these injuries require basic interventions. It's simple, easy. It uh, doesn't require any type of surgery or going uh, to the back to hypobaric chambers or anything like that. Uh, oh, sorry, guys. And gals. Um, so infection can be life-threatening to a limb. Uh, uh, it can, can be life-threatening or limb-threatening, sorry, especially in children, older adults, and people who have diabetes and other conditions that may compromise the immune syndrome. So if they already have these issues, and the same thing is if they already have an underlying issue and something of a soft tissue injury affects it, it could it could delay the healing process. Diabetics have troubles healing already. Um, soft tissue injuries and their complications can often be prevented by using simple protective actions. Um, for example, offshore is one of the things that they preach, preach, preach safety. Uh, the current company that I'm assigned to, they are very, very on you about being safe. Don't rush things. If it takes an extra day, because it wasn't safe, then it takes an extra day. They don't really fuss about it. They don't stay a whole lot. They just want, in the end, everybody to be safe. Job get done and everybody goes home. And they preach that all the way from the, the VP uh, all the way down to our OIM. They preach that very adamant about just not rushing. They want you to be safe. Uh, the skin is the first. Uh, Line of defense um, is the largest organ of the body. Yeah, that's probably going to be a test question. It is relatively tough. You know, depends on where you want to talk about about what's tough, where it's at. You know, your feet are tough because you walk on it pretty all the time. You know, it's on shoes. It's a hard impact area, and injuries may expose blood vessels, nerves, and other bones. Um, those aren't normally typically to see injuries. Uh, that's why once they do get exposed, they do have some more issues. Uh, your blood vessels are protected by the skin. Uh, 
nerve endings stop in certain areas so they don't have any type of exposures. But at the same time is it can cause issues um, when they have exposures. So that may be something that uh, you see later on as we go through here about uh, you know, nerve damage and why it's that way. Uh, in all instances, EMTs must control the bleeding, which know that's the ABC. We want to fix that initially. I prevent further contamination to decrease the risk of infection. If we can, uh, sometimes we don't have the, the time because of everything's time sensitive, but things uh, need to be washed out. They need to be controlled. They need to be uh, cleaned before we transport it or put it or cover it uh, before we transport. Uh, if we can wash that wound off, let's get the dirt, grime and everything out of there. Uh, let's try to help protect the uh, infection area, but at the same time is life over limb. If we need to go, we'll, we'll go and we'll address that later. Apply dressing and bandages to very parts of the body. Sometimes it's just not as simple as taking that Curlex uh, and wrapping it around the body because it's just not working. Uh, you have to compromise and you know figure out how to get it in the area and wrap it to where it can help to control the bleeding. Or what can what can I use to help me secure that ABD pad? Those are some of the things that we try to think about in EMS that's always challenging uh, is for us to you know, make things work out a little bit of nothing. So that's kind of our specialty is we, we are pretty quick on the fly. Uh, some of the skin varies in thickness. We know that uh, depending on a person's age and skin location. Um, and elderlies have more uh, frail skin. You know, they'll get the skin tears. Uh, they bleed really bad. They look really nasty. But in realistically, what it is, is that top layer of skin has so much elasticity in it that it tears or peels off. It's kind of like taking a cheese grater in the top layer of the cheese block. And it's, I hate those because they look super bad and you're just like, oh, that's, that's nasty. But th those are kind of the basic ideas. Uh, skin is, the, uh, is thinner on the eyelids, lids, and ears than on the scalp, back, and soles of feet. Uh, it's kind of tougher. We know that those are thicker. So we should, you know, it's going to be harder to tear. It's not saying that it won't but at all, but it will, it is harder. Um, a little bit of anatomy of the skin. Uh, the skin has two principles. Uh, we talk about the epidermis and the dermis. Uh, the epidermis is tough. The external layers that forms a, a water tight covering of the body. When I like ducks, uh, it, it does, you know, water does roll off our skin, but at the same time is it's not a, we're not gonna float like the ducks do. Uh, the epidermis is composed of several layers. Show you a picture in just a second. The derma is the inner layer of the skin. It contains hair follicles, sweat glands, and uh, subcutaneous gland. Uh, blood vessels in the dermis provide skin without uh, nutrients and oxygen. Here's a pretty cool picture. It talks about where the hair follicle starts, where your fascia and your muscle starts, and it works its way up to subcutaneous fat. Um, and they build through there. So it's the same time that at least everybody has pulled out a hair that, that the root was contested to. And you can see that it has like a blood vessel that kept it alive. Uh, and the process of like, uh, sometimes you may have a nerve really close to it that tingles. You're like, ooh, what was that? Um, if you see it broken down there. Um, uh, and here, this is where your pores are. Sweat glands. That's how you sweat. A lot of times, this is where you will get uh, the facial acne, fills up your pore, um, kind of push it up and kind of harvest down here in the sweat gland. Just a little tidbit there. Um, skin covers all the external surface of the body. There's not one part that's not covered by skin that's on the external surface. So that's why it's part of the, it is the largest organ of the body. Uh, the various openings in the body are lined with mucous membrane. Uh, some mucous membranes provide a protective barrier against bacterial invasion. Um, somebody tell me an area that when you and I said that, where was the first place you were thinking about that has that mucous membrane on your body? That you can tell us. Your gums. I was waiting to see. I was like, somebody's going to say something. Let's see. Um, so, yeah, your gums are covered by that mucous membrane. And it's, you know, it's 
we put tons of things in our mouths. So uh, it's just another protector barrier. Uh, some of the uh, skin nerves may function. Sir, skin serves as many functions here. We talk about it helps the, with the fluid balances, uh, the sensories of the organ, uh, assist in regulation of body temperature because you can sweat, uh, you can start shivering, helps produce uh, the muscle burn, and the barrier against infections. And it's our frontline barrier. It's not going to keep you from getting an infection. Uh, you may have a puncture in the skin and infection may get in that way. Um, as everybody knows, I hope you do, uh, MRSA lives on the skin, lives in the nose. That's why it's always best not to pull the nose hair. It's the best to cut it. Um, certain areas, like we just don't pull our hair out. We just cut our hair because it continues to grow. But uh, it helps keep that from happening. So you can, you can get sick from your own body. But a lot of times it's a, an invasion of an infection from an open wound that causes it. I'm sorry, it'll stop in a minute. So we know that any break in the skin can cause an infection to enter the, the body and potentially cause that infection. Uh, with the fluid infections, uh, you, you can uh, be septic. Uh, you can have redness and fever. Your white blood cell count goes up in those areas. Um, and being with the skin, uh, we keep that from the fluid loss happening. So we're not dumping water or you know sweat out of certain areas. And then the loss of temperature control. When the body goes into shock, it's something that we just can't control. So we shunt the blood flow from the exterior part of the body and it starts to come into the core. Well, the skin's the first thing that it starts pulling from. No, it's not gonna die. But at the same time, it's, it, you'll, you'll be able to, to tell that a temperature change is happening because of your body. So that's the reason why we wanna try to always keep our patients warm and comfortable. Um, even if it's, you know, 9,000 degrees in the back of your ambulance and the patient says they're shivering, you got to make it warm for the patient, not just you. Uh, sometimes that sucks, especially when they want the heat on and it's 95 degrees outside. But again, it's about keeping the patient stable and warm. Uh, three types of soft tissue injuries. We should know this. We've already went over this one. Uh, burns, closed injuries, and opened injuries. Um, some of the patho of, of the uh, closed and open injuries. Uh, healing of the wounds is a natural process because that starts on the inside. It's like uh, when they stitch you from the inside out is because the body's going to uh, heal and the cells are going to grow. And it's going to push everything out. And so when you shed the skin, it's already healed from the inside. So uh, it, it heals itself back together, um, and it starts in the inner and moves out. Um, let's see. The next wound healing stage is inflammation. Additional cells move into the damaged area to begin the repair. White blood cells migrate to the area to combat pathogens that have invaded the exposed tissue. Lymphocytes destroy bacteria and other pathogens. Mast cell release histamine, and the inflammation ultimately leads to the removal of a foreign material. Um, prime example one is think about like a splinter. Uh, you may get the infection that builds up, and the pus that comes out is the infection that the body has created due to the white blood cells. Uh, it's trying to fight it out because it, it doesn't belong there. So uh, that's why we try to fight it and get it out, and that's where you'll get this, the swelling, uh, the redness, potential pus, because of it's an invasion of an outside source. Uh, contusions. So contusions result from a blood force strike injury. Um, it, it can happen. Uh, they call it a, a blunt force striking the body. But I mean, no matter what, if it did not break the skin, initially it's going to be classified as a blunt force uh, injury. Uh, the epidermis remains intact, but cells within the dermis are damaged, and small blood vessels are usually torn. Uh, the buildup of blood buildup of blood produces a characteristic blue or black discoloration called ecchymosis. So that's where you get your external bruising from, or your internal bruising that you can see from the outside. Um, and then you'll have your clotting factor. That's where the scab comes from when you uh, get injured and you have a cut to your hand. Matter of fact, I 
my cuticles are always the worst. They always bleed and make this horrible thing as soon as I come out here. Um, let's see, uh, a collection of blood when damaged tissue or the, uh, and the body cavity occurs when a large blood vessel is damaged and bleeds rapidly and usually associated with the extensive tissue damage. Uh, crush injury is the extent of the damage depending on how much force is applied, how long the force is applied, and this continued compression of the soft tissue will cut off circulation Produce, producing further tissue dis destruction. So that's basically what we're doing. We're creating a crushing syndrome, a crushing injury with a tourniquet. So if I apply this because of a massive cut, yes, it's an open injury. You're probably gonna have a hematoma at some point through there, but because it's not clotting in time, we turn around and apply the blood pressure. I mean, a, a tourniquet, so at that point, we know that we can apply it. And yes, it's potentially what can cause some damage. Um, I hope we've all, you know, had that. Some things happen where you, you get cut sometimes and then it, you have the black and blue area. And it's a pretty bad cut. Probably should have gone and got stitches, but it's real sore. takes time to heal. Well, that's part of the cells regenerating. And that's what they're trying to grow back. So... When applying the tourniquet, sometimes that's, it's going to take that much longer and you're probably going to have to go to surgery. Um, it takes a lot longer uh, for cell, cell, cell regrowth uh, once application of a tourniquet, if, if, it does, if it does happen at all. Um, when the area of a body is trapped for longer than four hours and the arterial blood flow is compromised, crush syndrome can develop. When a patient's tissues are crushed beyond repair, muscle cells die and release a harmful substance in and around the tissues. It becomes necrotic, and necrotic uh, basically eats the muscles, uh, and it, it, it'll die. Um, harmful substances are released into the body circulation uh, after the limb is freed and the blood is returned. Um, advanced life support providers should administer IV fluids before the crushing object is lifted. Probably, I mean, field surgeons are requested a lot at that time or field doctors that can kind of take over. Uh, feeling the body part for entrapment, freeing the body part from entrapment can also create a potential for a cardiac arrest due to renal failure because it's a dump of all that. The hormone, I mean, uh, what I just say, it's the, what they just call it a harmful substance. So, it's the toxins that are released in the body once that uh, crushing syndrome is, is freed. So you can create a, because uh, it goes through the heart to get cleared. You gotta get uh, the fluid and the blood and all that's gotta get clean. So once it gets into the heart, it can trigger respiratory, I mean, cardiac arrest. Uh, consider requesting ALS assistance for situations for prolonged entrapment to uh, prolonged entrapment from extrication. So that is something we have to be careful about. Uh, and I mean, like I've told y'all a couple of times before, I've had doctors fly out. Um, we've done in the field uh, amputations. Uh, it's, I remember being on one that they did an amputation. We still couldn't get the leg out because of where it was. And four hours after we were able to move the vehicles and all that and finally cut the leg free. And we had to transport that to the hospital. That was that was pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, I still remember it. All right. Compartment syndrome develops when edema and swelling results in increased pressure with a closed soft tissue compartment. Uh, pressure increases with the compartment, uh, which refers and uh, which and interferes with the circulation. Ah. Delivery of nutrients and oxygen is impaired and by product of normal meta metabolism accumulate. Uh, there is pain, especially on a passive movement. Uh, the longer the situation persists, the greater the chance for uh, tissue death. Uh, and then continuously reassess skin color, temp, and pulse distal to the injury site for crushing uh, if suspected. And severe closed injuries can damage the internal organs because what's happening is all this buildup of fluid, uh, buildup of toxins is all created right inside and it's got nowhere to go. 
it would be better if it was an open injury and then it could leak out, uh, ooze out, flow out, squirt out, because it's now it's being maintained in our body and it's got to get filtered and cleaned through our heart. It's, it's very, it's potentially fatal as we've already just talked about, but at the same time as if it just had somewhere to go or you were able to lance it uh, at the hospital and all that was to leak out, the better outcome you could take, but not all places can have that happen. You can't just stick a drain in because you're trying to get that out. You still have to worry about the, the, the flow, the pressures, the, you know, the input, the output of the heart. Those are some big, big things you got to worry about. Oh, let's see here. Open injuries, there's four types. We talked about uh, a brace. You, I guarantee you 90% of y'all have probably had at least two of these, uh, two of the four, abrasions, lacerations, avulsions, and penetrating wounds. Uh, throughout this next little few slide shows, if you have a weak stomach, I highly suggest be very cautious. Um, you may want to close your screen for a little bit and just listen. Um, so an abrasion, that's basically just like from you riding a bike as a young kid, you've fallen off and you move that, remove that superficial layer of the skin. That's, that's not bad, but we've all had that. It kind of looks like a skin graft too, if y'all can see. It looks like they just rem removed that with a knife so they could skin graft it, but it gets worse. All right, so now we're gonna talk about a laceration. A laceration is basically um, being cut with a, by a knife. It's a smooth, well, it's a smooth or rigid cut. It can be jaggered, uh, it can, can be torn, but that's considered a laceration. Um, it says the incision is sharp, uh, it's a smooth cut. It just depends on what it's been cut by. That's what you gotta think about too. It still is an, uh, a, a laceration, but what it got cut by, they, they may say, oh, well, now that's such and such. You're like, bro, just, just take care of it. I don't care. Um, so here's an avulsion. An avulsion separates various layers of the soft tissue so that they become either completely detached or hang as a flap. Often there is significant bleed. If possible, replace the flat avulsion lap in its original position and never remove an avulsion skin flap regardless of the size. So if this right here on this picture was just torn from, from this corner to this corner and it tore all the way up and then now it's laying back here, that don't don't cut that off. Leave that skin there. Um, don't be like, oh, well, we just cut it. No, because it's not your job. That's, I don't, I wish I knew where that, that kind of looks like a knee, but don't, don't cut no skin. And even if it's on yourself, don't, don't cut no skin, it's okay. Uh, we did go over an amputation uh, as an injury was the body parts completely severed. Um, I hope that uh, when you go to the boot camp that you'll be able to have time to put on a practice tourniquet just so you can put your hands on one if you've never had, uh, help some of the other ones that if they had and there's not enough room, you can uh, also allow it to be put on yourself. Um, if, as long as it's training. Um, they usually, penetrating wounds usually uh, are relatively small in entrance uh, because it, it's, so if it's like a knife or a bullet, um, they're going to be a small entrance, but they can do produce very little external bleeding depending upon how it was put into the body. Um, if it's like in the abdomen, like I told you the other night about the story about the girl that got shot in the crease of her butt, you, you just wouldn't have found those um, doing your assessment. Um, and it may damage the structures deep inside the body if it's a knife fight or a, uh, a knife that if you have a shot, if somebody's been shot, uh, you'll have that penetrating trauma that may cause the ripples we went over the bullets went over the path the balloon that it creates uh or it could just be a tumble all around because of the being a 22 something to that matter uh let's see yeah once the presence of foreign materials inside the tissue can lead to an, an infection so that's the reason why they want to try to clean it out real good or 
you know, if they believe that something's stuck in there, they may uh, have to go back in and uh, check for anything that was uh, left behind from post-surgery. Um, a stabbing or shooting is often a result of multiple penetrations. Um, assess the part of the, the patient carefully to identify all the wounds. Look for everything that you can think of. Look, just look for it. Uh, count the number of penetrating injuries, especially the wound uh, with uh, gunshot wounds. In addition, uh, determine what type of gun was used in the shooting and do not let this patient uh, delay transport. If you have to take them on and you're still in the process of doing the initial assessment and how many holes and uh, route of travel, you know, I don't ask you to go out there and do CSI, but you know, just letting the crew know that my patient was shot six times. Um, they're looking for a credit. I mean, they're you're going to be trying to quit looking for holes and just fix it. Stop the bleeding. Uh, blast injuries often result in multiple penetrating injuries. Uh, so the mechanism of an injury of a blast injury is generally due to three factors. We talk about this the other night. I'm not going to go over it. Primary blast injuries, secondary blast, and tertiary blast injuries. Uh, before you care for a patient with an open wound, follow the standard precautions. Uh, if it's life-threatening and bleeding is observed, uh, a team member a, assign a team member to apply direct pressure over the wound because they, that needs to stop. We know, we know we want to stop the bleeding up front. If the wound is to the chest, upper arm, or upper back, cover it with an occlusive dressing. So how many people know what a, how you secure an occlusive dressing? Anybody? Yeah, so quiet. Uh, let me see what I have over here. Oh, my chest seals are not there. Um, so here's what we're going to do. So we also have chest seals uh, that are designed that have uh, a, an, it's, it's made for a chest seal, so it lets the air out with a one-way valve. But if this is what I'm going to apply as an inclusive dressing, I want to apply it to the chest. I want to tape it on three sides and I'll leave the bottom open. Why does somebody think I want to leave the bottom open versus the top? So it can drain. You've done it before, haven't you? Yes. <laughs> Good deal. And that's why it's because, so if we tape the top, it's going to pull potentially if we have blood that's in there, but it's going to be harder to get something to blow up and get the, the, the plastic or the potential tinfoil, whatever you're tie taping down to get some little air in there. So you want to do you want to tape it on uh, the, the, the left top and right side, leave the bottom open. So if there is air, air can come out, can't go back in. And if blood does come out of it, we can also uh, the blood can drop down, um, which is a good way to also assess that because it's a visual assessor. So if you can keep that clear uh like ziploc bags are really good you can cut them in half uh true chest true chest seals are all clear with the little one-way valve in the center it's a uh, it's clear but it has a like a four by four and a one-way valve at the top kind of looks like an old style whoopee cushion in my opinion um i've used multiple of those and i've also had to use plenty of plastic ziploc bags too um this uh control bleeding uh using direct pressure uh elevation is the big one too if you apply direct pressure and elevate i mean if the pressure does not stop it and it continues to ooze and you've held it for a few minutes you know and you're just like man this this is not working what's the deal you can turn around and also um put a tourniquet on so a tourniquet is a last resort, but 
when it's a last resort, don't forget that it's also nowadays it's a first resort because uh, we know these things are going to happen. Uh, we're, we're a lot more trained with the tourniquets than what we used to be. Um, it used to be only trained personnel, no lay person. Now we teach the class to any Tom, Dick, and Harry that want to show up to a class to stop the bleed or how to treat them, you know, so we, you don't have to have that background. Um, but make sure, like we talked the other night, how if you know that a tourniquet was put on at this time, write it, it's in there correctly. If you crank it down and you put it in the, the, the windlass is the bar is the, is the thing you turn. If you put it in the holder and you put the Velcro over it, always, always, always double check yourself because you don't want that to slip and pop uh, the windlass open and it opens and starts bleeding again. Um, I've seen it happen, so just think about that. So in the next few pictures, it's the next one exactly is kind of nasty. So I don't know if you guys have prepared for an avulsion, but I'm going to show you. Um, all open wounds are considered to be contaminated uh, as a, and present a risk of infection. So we want to clean it, uh, try to wash it off. You always want to apply sterile dressing to keep the, ri the risk of contamination down. But and then you're thinking, well, if I apply water, wouldn't something stick to the water? Yes. But at the same time, as you, you can wash it over and over and over. Uh, do not remove from material at all from an open wound, no matter how dirty the wound is. Uh, if you can't, don't sit there and try to pick it. If you can't wash it off, that's fine. You've washed it, you've tried. Uh, small wound surfaces without significant bleed can be flushed uh, with sterile saline prior to uh, applying the dressing. So we can, most ambulance services have uh, sterile water uh, in bottles. And then you can also use a IV solution. It's not what it's made for, but it's, it's close. Uh, chemical burns and contamination should be flushed to remove any remaining chemicals. Now, again, please make sure if it's a chemical and it's a powder that it's not reactant to water. If you have to and you need to, you are able to brush it off with a, a cut or a potential wound, uh, don't apply water until you know what it is. Because you could potentially make that chemical react to water and end up burning them. In most circumstances, hospital personnel, rather than EMS, uh, will clean the. In most circumstances, hospital personnel, rather than EMTs, will clean open wounds. That didn't really sound much, but uh, in some cases, you can better control bleeding from open soft tissue wounds by splinting the extremity if there is also no fracture. All right, so here we go. This is an abdominal wound. This is an abdominal evisceration. Um, so what's happened is there's been a small hole uh, or, a, or a past surgery uh, and an evisceration, the organs protrude through the wound. Um, I have not, what gets me here is you can see that there's some leftover tape here um, that may be results of a, of a bandage. But the only one I've ever seen in my career was from a lady who had just had a hysterectomy surgery. I literally drove to the Wendy's right across the street and upon her to being discharged, not while she was still in the hospital, um, sneezed, blew her stitches, and her, her, her gut fell out. Instead of driving back over, they called an ambulance, and it was like, yeah, we'll leave the hospital to go get them and bring them right back to the hospital. Didn't make a whole lot to it. But, um, so what you want to do here is, cl is clean it, keep it a moist dressing over the over the injuries and transport them to the hospital don't don't poke them back in when something's out leave it out if the bar come through and you're trying to like oh well, we can sterilize and push that bar back through just just stop just just stop them and tell them no it's okay we got this um some here's I've talked about it again cover the wound with sterile gauze Secure the gauze and occlusive dressing, keep the organs moist and warm. Um, so once you cover it, uh, you'll add some more uh, saline water and keep the area moist and on the hospital. That is not life-threatening. It does require initial emergency transport, 
but I'm not gonna run that lights to the siren, lights and sirens of the hospital unless it's from a penetrating object uh, that somebody removed was getting there, or they're having shortness of breath, cardiac related issues, or some issues related to that. That is not a lights and sirens back to the hospital call from my book. I understand why it's classified that way, but it's it's not something that's gonna kill them. Um, Impaled objects, uh, we've talked about that. The only, only, only remove an impaled object when the object in the cheek or mouth and obstructs the airway. The objects in the chest and directly, uh, it does interfere with CPR. So if it's in the cheek of the mouth and obstructs the airway and it affects with CPR, it's the only two things that you can remove them for. If the patient if the object is very long, secure it and then shorten it. So you've seen the ones where like somebody landed on one of those pokey, sharp metal fence posts and they cut the post off and transport them. Or the ones where the guy that's got a limb stuck in his arm or his neck. Those are, those are your one-off calls. Um, not gonna say you won't see some crummy stuff in your career. Things happen. If you're, if you're a white cloud or a black cloud, um, just talk to some of your folks around the fire service and they can tell you quickly. Uh, it depends on what kind of calls you get or EMS folks, if you're a white cloud or a black cloud. Because the white clouds never have the bad stuff. Black clouds, I tote one around all the time. I always have crazy stuff happen to me. And, and I get some of the craziest calls. Um, always provide rapid transport when you get in something like this that's uh, come out impelled object. It needs to be treated in a timely manner. Now, if it took you four hours to find this person, that's fine. But you still want to go lights and sirens back to the trauma center for them. Um, and I just say trauma center because it's they're more set up to have that. They have surgery, all that stuff on staff, 24 hours a day. So if it's something that regulates or requires them to have surgery, they can have it done right there on site. They don't have to worry about it. Uh, let's see, neck injuries. The biggest thing I want you to know about neck injuries, if it's to the throat area or to the side of the neck. Obviously, if you feel that they've had uh, neck injuries from a car wreck, that's completely separate. Uh, always put them in a seat collar. Um, if enough air is sucked into the blood vessels, it can block the flow of uh, blood into the lungs and cause cardiac arrest. That's what we think about when we talk about an air embolism. Uh, this could impair the circulation to the brain and cause to have a stroke. Use caution with patients who suffer from a neck injury, depending on the most uh, on the MOI. And immobilize the cervical spine if indicated. Um, so you got to put them in a seat collar because you're just like, ah, I don't know what to do. It's, uh, I don't know if I should leave it off or not. Just go ahead and put it on. It's fine. The hospital can take that off. They're going to shoot an x-ray anyway. So. I can say for the service that I work for part time is if the complaint, if the patient has a complaint of, C, of back pain or neck pain, you C collar them. If they don't have one, you don't C collar them and you don't use backboards. Um, it is getting more and more and more common that you don't use backboards at all in EMS, you only use them. Uh, when you have uh, cervical spine issues or you're complaining of back pain. So it may be something that you just put that person right down on the stretcher and let them ride to the facility uh, because they are causing more and more damage later down the road. So small animal bites, any type of animal bite. Uh, I don't know if y'all know this, but um, Mississippi, the animal has to be secured for 24 hours to make sure it doesn't have rabies, they'll draw blood, they'll send it off. They bill you if it's your dog. Um, and they must hold them for 48 hours. And I think you have to go to court in Mississippi, even if it's like, man, it's just Fred, it's his dog, it's my next door. And if the police find out, they, they have to go the whole nine yards. Um, it's animal bites are, are gross. Uh, if we talk about Smaller animals, let's say like a raccoon or um, even turtles and all that, they 
they have bacteria that grows in their mouth. I know cats and all that that want to talk about like they're clean and dogs' mouths. I'm talking about your wild animals. Um, a lot of times the bacteria is growing so fast in their body that you don't want that in yours either. So you'll notice like if you get bit at all, and I'm not just talking about a fish bite, but uh, if you're listening, you get you really need to go get that checked out, period, because the animal bites should be evaluated, should be flushed out, and you're probably going to be put on some antibiotics anyway. So if you get cold, you're going to want to go ahead and just treat that as a infected wound, uh, wash clean, uh, wrap, and keep warm and dry all the way to the facility to have them get it checked out. And again, that's not warranted a life or death or a life emergency call. Unless they start to have trouble uh, respiratory or their ABC start compromising. Um, let's see, a major concern in the spread of rabies, which we know that's an issue there. Um, if an animal bites you and they think that it's rabies, the only way to test for that is, uh, I'm sure that I'm just going to be made sure I can be told otherwise, but if so, please tell me that you, they, the animal has to be just. I say destroy is the best way to do it. Rebecca, is that, I don't know if that's the right term, but they have to be killed uh, and they have to test in the brain to make sure that they have rabies. Am I correct on that? So, so yes, they have to be decapitated and it's sent off to test the brain. And to kind of spin off on that, I was actually pregnant with my last child and we had a cat come in with a litter of kittens and a skunk came and attacked the mama and she was defending her babies and of course the skunk had rabies and yeah so that was a sad situation all the way around well i've had a pet skunk they're amazing pets um can't really tell that you have them they're against the law in our state to have them some states allow you to have them but that was one of the best best inside pets that i've ever had a litter box train they're fun to even play with you have the, the stinker removed obviously but he was up on the shots i mean he had everything he was cool uh super cool lovey man he loved to love on me but he would bite you and play around and he wasn't like you know, ferocious bite because that's not he was we had him since he was like two days old so uh kind of cool off to the next topic oh go um so human bites are just as nasty and uh, just as nasty come on who am i talking to and just as nasty you do want to uh it's con it, consider it also to be uh an infection because the, the human mouth holds an arraignment of bacteria. Um, yeah, we're not like, oh, that's gross. I need to go, you know, bleach my mouth out. No, but specifically when you bite onto somebody else and you break the skin, that needs to be treated too, it's just as a uh, as an infection or, you know, it needs to be checked out for blood to be drawn and all that. Consider any human bite that has penetrated the skin as very serious injury. Uh, any laceration caused by human tooth can result in a serious spreading infection. Um, you can get all sorts of MRSA on there. You can get, um, well, I forgot all the different types of infections, but they, it's, it's not, it's not nice. I mean, you can get pretty sick off another human bite. Um, I don't know where it got bit on the hand. I don't know if y'all can tell. I see the, the index, the middle finger knuckle, but it was like a scratch to me. But no matter what, you want to take them to the emergency department if they, if, if they keep pushing on getting transported. Uh, and I don't mean that you don't need to take them. Is at the same time as they can go to a walk-in clinic and get the same thing, not tie up the ER. Um, as everybody knows, the hospitals are overwhelmed nowadays. Um, I heard from a, my good friend, she called me today. She was actually sitting on the wall with a patient at our trauma center 
and they had been there for five hours and the patient's still on the stretcher. Uh, there was nowhere to put them, so you had to sit and wait. So I be an advocate of the patient too at the same time, but don't try to sway them to say, hey, look, if you just take yourself to a, a walk-in clinic, you're going to get seen a lot faster, which is still true. But if they're like, no, I want to go to the ER. All right, well, I'll be with you to the end of shift. You know, something like that. Um, I feel like it's been talking for an hour. Gee. So burns. So um, burns are serious. Um, I've had first and second degree burns. I had second degree and third degree burns on my face on this side. I uh, went to a burn center. It's kind of another reason why I like to keep a beard. Uh, I, I can still see the scar, but it's, I spent four months in a burn center uh, from burns to my face, not like consecutive, but going back and forth and all that, getting treatments. Um, so burns hurt. Um, all burns, uh, a burn occurs when the body our body part receives more radiant heat, uh, radiant energy than it can absorb. So like heat, toxic chemicals or electricity, all of those can burn, uh, open flames. And you know, the fire tetrahedron, if you don't know it, it's, it's a fuel, heat and oxygen. And once those three to get there, it becomes fire. If you remove one of those, you don't have a fire. Uh, you can have uh, different types of heat though, that's created from that. Anytime that you create a burn or go respond to a burn or work on a burn, you want to do a full AL, a full BLS assessment. You want to make sure that you're not missing potentially anything. Remember, during a burn, remove all the jewelry, uh, remove uh, some clothing. If you have to move the clothing back because it's an arm burn, go ahead and take the arm, the shirt off uh, or either cut it off. Just tell them it'd probably be easier. Um, it depends on what kind of some people are like oh I love this $15 shirt whatever dude just I need your arm out because they're going to cut it off when we get to the hospital um, children and older patients uh, and patients with chronic illnesses are more likely to experience shock so expect that um, you can have shock hit you in many different ways because it can be delayed because the patient's working on that fight or flight mode that, that dump of epinephrine can be there so just remember that you're like, oh, well, they're, they're not shocky right now, and I'm working on them for the last 10 minutes. Well, on your way to the facility, it, at some point, they may drop into shock, and you're like, um, I don't know what to do. And you'll have to figure out, be like, oh, okay, okay, let's fix this. Um, some of the pathophysiology of burns, burns are soft tissue injuries. They're spread over the large area and are created by a transfer of radiation. Uh, thermal, burst can, thermal burns can occur when skin is exposed to temperatures higher than 111 degrees. That's, that's pretty warm. Um, I know that you think you'll, you'll hear of the thermal burns also, uh, like from hot showers or children just held down in a hot bath, they'll get the skin burn. Um, so that's the reason why we try to say, you know, hot water heaters need to be set at a certain temperature. Uh, I forgot what that's supposed to be. It's like, what, 104 or something like that. It's the highest your hot water heater should go. Um, so think about the different types of burns. Uh, severity of a thermal burn uh, correlates directly with the temperature, how much of the concentration, how much was there, um, amount of heat, energy possessed by the object or substance, and the duration of exposure. We're going to take a break after this one. Uh, burn injuries are progressive. The greater the heat, the deeper the wound. Exposure time is another important factor. Think about if a patient is in a car wreck and the car catches on fire and they were stuck in there for 10 minutes before they were able to get them out. So you, you have an arrangement of there and also think about any type of burn automatically think about airway, what kind of uh, complications you're gonna get from that, uh, what, what can potentially be damaged. All this needs to be going through your head as you're responding to a, a potential burn, because as soon as dispatch tells you it was a burn to the arm, it's gonna be to the, you know, the arm, the upper arm and part of the face from them turning away from it. Um, it could have wrapped around and burnt some facial hair. So 
those burns and you want to know by what if there's a chance that you can see if it's an open flame uh was it an oven a convection oven because they both are different heat yes it's hot but they produce higher temperatures uh some we know that there's some you know in your house think about like the lamps on your nightstands can cause burns um heat lamps if you have those in your area because of heat um, I've never really liked putting heat lamps in dog cages because of potential fires and they're so close. Um, I just bring them in and put them in a garage or they're hoary house dogs. So have this going through your head as we start to hit this next little bit. How many slides is that? Oh, we'll just go ahead and hit the complication. Um, so when a person is burned, their, their skin is the first line of barrier that's gonna be that's gonna be burned. And it can be different types. It can be have first, second, or third degree. But when a person is burned, the barrier is destroyed. So know that it, that's, that's gone. Uh, it can potentially be regrowth or grow on its own or can put from a burned skin graft. Uh, but you're going to have an infection, hypothermia, hypovolemia, and shock. Those are the four things that you're going to go through the process on the severity of burn. If it's a severe burn, four things you're going to deal with. Uh, you may not see them initially. Uh, the hypothermia will probably sit in real quick because now they're not able to regulate temperature because that massive induction of heat, the body's nerves are going, oh, God, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, oh, we got to figure this out. And then it starts, and then they just, boom, they go into a hypothermia stage. Uh, let's see, burns to the airway is probably the most important because you can, you'll lose that mucus uh, in the uh, hypothermic. So the swelling starts to happen and then you can get that complete airway obstruction. So if you know that there was a burn to the chest or let's say the person was stuck in a car wreck or uh, you're on a racetrack, automatically think of respiratory burns um, because they're breathing in that heat. Um, if that's something you're going to and you're not already on an ALS truck, you need to get a paramedic there uh, very rapidly because you're gonna to need to intubate that patient pretty quickly or be ready to intubate at a moment's notice when that patient stops breathing. Uh, because when they do, because of the burn or the full obstruction, you, so like when I start an IV, I can, I can stick you multiple times up until you're just like, hey bro, I'm, I'm done. But on intubation, when you go to start that intubation on somebody, um, you only got probably two chances because now the airway is already starting to swell and then you're creating more trauma to the airway by trying to put um, something in their airway uh, because now the airway is going to recognize something's, I've been burned. Now you're poking me with uh, a foreign object so what am I going to do? I'm going to go magically start swelling. Will that be the case? You're going to have to be careful about the airway. The circumferential uh, burns are going to create things and they're going to stop breathing on you. And the next thing you got to do is you got to get an, uh, an ALS airway uh, like a tracheostomy put in. Uh, circumferential burns to the chest, obviously it's going to try to, if you, you know, like if you burn something, it takes, if you cook a hamburger, you make it in this fat, the way after you cook it is this fat. So it's the same thing is going to be burning that from the chest. So now when you go to do CPR, it's like trying to do it on this counter. It's going to be very hard. Um, also burns to the extremity can lead to part compartment syndrome, resulting in the neurovascular uh, compromise uh, and is a reverse damage uh, if not appropriately treated and always suspect further complications and get a paramedic or a helicopter there pretty fast because you're going to need it. They're going to crash soon and you're going to be like, oh, Jesus, I don't know what to do. Thank you very much. Um, those get pretty traumatic after a while. Uh, let's take uh, let's shoot for 705. How about that? See y'all in just a few minutes. I need to go make a quick phone call and we'll come back at 7.05. Where's my cursor?
All right, sorry about that. Maybe it'll work. All right, so we talk about burns. We'll get into the point in a minute on how we evaluate the burns and how we calculate them. So, but there's five factors, five factors we need to talk about to help determine the severity of the burn. So the first two factors are the most important. What is the depth of the burn? You need to know how thick it is and what is the extent of the burn? Are any critical areas involved in that? Do we have like the face, the upper airway, the hands, the feet, or the genitalia? Are those five things involved? That's important. Um, does the patient have any pre-existing medical conditions or other injuries that would cause um, secondary is secondary primary secondary assessment issues when we talk about diabetes, uh, lung failure, anything to have to do with that? Is the patient younger than five years or age or older than 55 years old? Burns to the face are particularly important owning uh, to the potential of an air sometimes in my way of an airway involvement. Uh, burns to the hands or feet or just uh, over the joints, like right here, my elbow, that'd be a burn to a joint, are considered serious because of the potential for loss of function as a result of scarring. You know, I mean, it depends on who's worried about scarring and how big a severity of the burn. If it leaves a scar and I've been burned and I still have use of it, I'm okay with it. Um, depths of the burn. So let's talk about this. So, the, so superficial burns is a first degree burn uh, that involves the top layer of the skin only, which is the epidermis. The skin turns red, uh, but does not blister and burns through this top layer. What kind of burn is that? Does somebody want to tell me? Like, hmm, I don't know if I said that right. Give me an example of a first degree burn. There we go. I heard you, but I think I cut you off. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I was going to say like a sunburn, but sunburns can be more severe even. Correct. It, it's for a first degree burn. That's a pretty good example for people to keep the idea of. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, so partial thickness would be second degree burns. Um, so a second degree burn involves the epidermis and some portion of the dermis. So then the layer starts getting the depth of the, this depth is getting more involved. These burns do not destroy uh, entire thickness of the skin, nor is the subcutaneous tissue injured. So it just has, uh, it has initial trauma done to it. Typically the skin is moist, molted, and white and red. Uh, blisters are present, so don't ever pop the blisters. Don't ever do that. And they can have very intense pain. So a Full thickness or third degree burn that is extended through all layers of the skin and may involve subcutaneous muscle, bone, or internal organs. Uh, the burned areas is a dry leather and may appear white, dark brown, or even charred, where it has like looks like uh, charcoal. Um, uh, where did I leave off my notes? Uh, if their nerve endings have been destroyed, a severely burned area may have no feeling. Uh, the surrounding is less severely burned and may have extremely painful. Significant airway burns are serious, which we know because now they're going to uh, go into respiratory arrest and quit breathing on us. And it may be associated with a single hair within the... Hold on. Significant airway burns are serious, may be associated with singled, thinnest hair within the nose, snout, uh, soot around the mouth and nose, uh, hoarseness and hypoxia. Uh, these patients should rapidly transport to the ED and uh, they're capable for advanced airway. Um, so what we're looking for, if somebody's been involved in a uh, house fire um, or fallen into, let's say like a campfire, we look for burns in the nose, uh, around the mouth uh, and get them to open their airway. If the mouth looks extremely dry, you've probably had an airway burn to it and you're probably just to start worrying about uh, respiratory failure at this point uh, because it is a, it's a pretty quick burn and you've got to do something fast. Um, there's some pictures of first, second, third degree burns. Uh, you have your sunburn. This is your uh, partial thickness. It talks about the blisters and that's what a full 
and this poor guy's got burns to his face and they're using a uh they're, this individual's not tubed and they're using a full face mask which is not i hope she's very much chemically sedated um so severity of burns so the it's so the rule of palm, which you use your hand, estimates the surface area that has been burned by comparing it to the size of the patient's palm, which is roughly equal to 1% of the patient's total bottle surface area. So hold their hand up as equal or close to yours, or you can lay their hand on them and start measuring uh, what the percentage is. So then you have, so that's the rule of palm. So now you have the rule of nines. So estimate the extent of a burn by dividing the body into sections, each representing approximately 9% of the total body surface area. The portions differ for infants, children, and adults. Uh, when you calculate the extra, uh, the extent of the burn include only partial and full thickness. Document superficial burns do not include them in the, in the body surface area and to that your estimation you don't want to include that so here's the rule of nines so this is very 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 important y'all you will probably see this on your nationally registry no matter what everybody i've talked to has at least had some type of rule of nines um not many people teach the uh the palm method uh it's just the national way is the rule of nines so understanding Genitalia is 1%. The front, uh, the entire front and back portion of a child right here, the abdomen, the uh, chest and abdomen, abdominal is 18. Same thing for a child. Um, an adult, you have 18 and it's, the back is 18. Uh, the, the leg is 18 total, nine and nine and the head's nine. You notice the difference, you have eight, 12, and nine. Uh, so know these, uh, I'm just gonna tell you the rule of nines is very, very, very important. Um, I can't knock on the desk hard enough. I uh, don't know about your chapter tests, but pretty much gonna guarantee you that you're gonna see this or a question like it on the rule uh, on your national registry. You don't want to screenshot that. You want to, whatever you want to do, I will leave it there for just a second or two longer so y'all can, uh, you can also go back into your book on 2719. That is that, uh, that diagram is there. I highly suggest, suggest that y'all learn it uh, and memorize it. My suggestion. Oh. When you're assessing a burn, it is important to classify the victim's burns. Now, classifications burns are based upon your uh, source, depth, and severity. I just need to know what if it's from a, a an open flame or is it from a something that's been touched. Uh, you you need to know what type that that is. Uh, and the depth. Now, you, when I say depth, let's, let's, we're going to have to guess that. We're not going to be able to say, oh, no, I know that's exactly 8%. Well, I mean, it, it may only be a superficial burn. So um, from knowing the source of the burn can help you calculate that a little bit to give you an idea uh, if it took direct impingement heat, uh, like a blowtorch, that's going to cause, you know, severe burn. Um, let's see here. So when you, I'm actually going to just talk about this, these all at one time and we'll skip that. So when you do your patient assessment, your scene safety, uh, your primary assessment, your history taken, anything that involves in the burn, that starts from the get go. You know, hey, same thing we talked about before, from dispatch to the phone call to arriving on scene, what do you see? How do you treat it? The number one thing you want to do is, if safe enough, remove the patient from the fire uh, and then remove, it's, it's going to, they're going to have trouble re regulating body temperature, but you need to stop the burn, uh, extinguish it, remove the clothes if they're smolder, 
if their rings are on, you need to get that off as fast as you can. Um, when you do that assessment, you still want to hit your ABCs. Um, most of the time when you start talking about a uh, bleeding from a burn, uh, it, it's probably pre-existing. You should not have uh, a burn that's bleeding because it's going to send it shut. Um, check your airways. No matter what, always look for soot. And the airway is going to tell you if you have a respiratory burn. Um, and knowing that you can get an ALS unit there as fast as you can uh, for a potential airway burn, get that done fast. Uh, reach out to them. Uh, get your, you know, your ALS unit en route. Uh, so when you start talking about history taking, it just depends if they're alert or not. You know, you want to know. Their decap BTLS, uh, the pain, is it redness, the swelling? What about the, the burns or charring? Look for all those things. If they're able to respond to you, get a pain scale, uh, zero to 10, 10 being the worst. I understand it's a burn, but at the same time as it could not be the worst, you know, the worst thing that they have had happen to them. Um, on your history taking, always do a sample. Uh, OPQRST, if y'all remember that too. Um, you know, are you having any difficulty breathing? You know, or uh, I forgot what this one says. Or are you having any pain? Well, obviously, um, that that's going to be something severe that you're worried about. Continue your your assessing. Uh, primary will, should roll into your secondary assessment um, when you start looking at how you're going to uh, treat that. Is your treatment, or have you used a burn blanket for your treatment? Reassess that. You know, to check their status. And this is going to be a Q5 issue. You're not going to Q10 it because it is a trauma. Um, uh, a major burn is going to be considered your trauma. And it's probably going to be the longest call of your life uh, because it's so severe. I'm not saying your other traumatic issues or not, but we don't normally deal with burns. Uh, that's something that's rare. Uh, and EMS, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. You could run 10 your first week, but we... If they are, they're very far few between, okay? Um, do your reassessment like I was talking about. Check those, make sure they're working. Uh, and what, so look right here. So what can we do? The first thing I want you to do is stop the burning process, okay? And prevent any type of additional injury. Um, remember where you remove the patient to, um, or if you, you know, you're out and you don't know and you try to take this patient and, you dunk them in, let's say, a pond water to try to stop the burn. Well, you've also probably potentially exposed their skin to uh, some additional um, bacteria that wouldn't have been known. So don't cause any more harm. So that's kind of a big issue there is when you start looking at that, be cautious, remove it, cut the clothing off, um, however you can to stop that uh, uh, prevent. Uh, any additional injuries. Remember when you take and lay them down, where you lay them, uh, if you lay them in the, in the grassy area, remember grass is going to get entangled into that burn and you, you, you're not going to be able to wash it off because at the same time as you don't, you still you induce a cold water, now you're inducing shock to the patient. So be cautious about that. So um, it's one of those, you're, it's danged if you do and danged if you don't because you're, you're trying your best to stop remove the patient from the burn, but, or from the burning, and then you're trying to stop the burn, and you're like, ah, I don't know where to put it, because I don't want them to get any more injuries, so, you know, it's, be cautious, but at the same time, be alert, um, it says, when caring for a patient, follow the steps in, uh, page, uh, skill deal, skill drill 27-2, so that may be something y'all want to look at, uh, so you can get some ideas, uh, and just some extra, uh, input. I don't have the skill drill on me. It's not am I. I probably could get it out of the book, but uh, obviously I don't have the book out here. So thermal burns. So thermal burns are caused by heat, which we know that. I mean, ultimately, yeah, fire has heat. So it, would it all be classified as a thermal burn? Well, yes, but there's, you know, yes, but no. So a flame burn is very often a deep burn, especially if a person's clothes catches on fire. A scald burn is mostly caused by uh, commonly seen in children uh, and, and handicapped adults, but can happen to anybody. 
especially while you're cooking, if you're trying to heat that water or boil that water up, uh, you could actually hit that pot and now that the boiling water is all over you. Um, uh, maybe you accidentally hit that boiling water pot and send it all over your own child. Now you're probably gonna feel like you know warm death after it's over because you just traumatized your child and you sent your child to the hospital and probably DHS probably gonna come visit you, make sure you didn't do it on purpose because I can promise you it's somebody's going to report you or you're gonna talk to somebody at the hospital. I think yeah. Um, coming in contact with hot objects uh, can pr uh, produce uh, burns. Contact burns are rarely deep unless the patient is prevented from drawing away. Um, grab it onto a hot lighter after it's been lit for a hot minute and not knowing. Um, reaching down and grabbing a hot pan, you know, your instinct is to jerk. Now, if you have diabetes and you start to lose the, the feeling of certain, you know, parts of your lower body, uh, you're not going to be able to feel if your legs are on fire. So you may not know it until it's too late or let's say if you're asleep and you, you know something catches on fire and in, in the deer camp and you don't just know that I've, I've seen that happen way too many times that uh, people are affected that way and uh, get that infection and the diabetes doesn't allow it to heal just right and they're in a lot worse case than they should have been because they just didn't take care of themselves that's it's, it's sad but oh so true um, steam burns suck. Uh, they are topical. Most of the time they are very uh, top side of the skin. Uh, they don't, um, let's say modern steam burns are common when microwaving food covered with a plastic. Um, a flash burn is produced by an explosion, which may briefly expose a poison, a person to a very intense heat. Um, think about uh, an industrial setting when you think about that type of burn. Um, lightning strikes can also cause a flash burn. Um, I watched a documentary a couple months ago that a man had been struck by lightning seven times in his life. And I'm like, sir, I don't, I don't want to be friends with you. I don't want to know you because you have some bad luck. So uh, people just, they're they're open and they, they have bad luck. Well, this dude has the bad chi. If he got stuck seven, struck seven times by, by playing by lightning. Whew. So how do we manage these? Our management is the same thing. So stop the burning. Uh, cool the burned area off if, if appropriate. Obviously move the jewelry. We know that's going to happen. You're going to keep that idea that they're going to have uh, an inhalation injury. Um, increased exposure time will uh, increase damage to the patient. How long was this on? How long contact did they have? Were they conscious or unconscious when this thermal burn was taking place? Uh, the larger the burn, more likely the patient will be susceptible to hypothermia and hypovolemia, uh, sugar problems. Uh, uh, all patients with large surface burns should have a dry sterile dressing applied. Uh, a burn blanket's really good. You can have, um, you, you're going to have to cover them, but you be cautious in what you cover them with, like a sheet, because it's going to stick. Uh, think about that when you try to be that good Samaritan and you're like, oh, I can put this, oh, it's stuck to them now. So that's the one is we don't want you to cause any more harm, but let's think about that. Um, inhalations, our number one issue that we're worried about there is upper, respir upper respiratory damage. And that's obviously uh, associated with inhalation of the superheated gases. Um, inhalation does occur when burning takes place. Uh, let's say if I'm in a let's say, uh, enclosed trailer and something's caught fire, well, I gotta, it's not venting. So I potentially am breathing in that hot flame until I can get out. Uh, lower airway damage uh, is also because of in, inhaling like chemical burns or particulate matter. That's why in the industrial setting, they're very particular about uh, wearing masks. And you should too, if you're going to be in an area where there's going to be chemicals or you're mixing or spraying chemicals. Um, on the side, my side business, I run a pressure washing company and I use uh, some pretty harsh chemicals. I wear, I wear a mask when I use that. Um, they're not deadly or, you know, toxic to uh, me spraying on your house or your concrete or something like that. But 
as the close proximity as I am to them, uh, I want to take precaution because it is it's it they are harmful, but when you dilute them the way we do, it, it works pretty well. Uh, you may encounter severe upper way swelling um, that requires immediate intervention if if it's something that you already have a medical need to they need to handle that faster. Uh, consider um, ALS. If you're the only one that's there and you have the you don't have ALS close, you need to get potentially air uh, air transport. If you notice a strider, a uh, horse voice, a horse voice. Uh, signs of singed nasal hairs, burns on the face, or carbon particulates in the septum. Uh, those are the things you want to get them to look up. And, you know, you can pull the nose down just a little bit and see if they have that carbon in there. Uh, I don't know uh, at, at the basic level, but it talks about a, apply a cool mist, like an aerosol spray, uh, humidified oxygen to help reduce some of the minor edema. But I don't know like what service is going to allow the basics to do that. So, and then uh, by the time you get that set up, it, it's probably going to be lower, lower down on your priority list because you're so more concerned about getting everything else done and transporting them to the hospital because you're going to be like, oh, I got to make sure I follow the protocols. Oh my God, what am I supposed to be doing? Uh, so think about that. Let's see here, two seconds. Um, so inhalation burns, carbon monoxide, we know that is the silent killer. Uh, patients who with severe CO2 poisoning usually have a normal oxygen saturation. Now hydrogen cyanide is generally uh, generated by combustion. Uh, signs and symptoms involve central nervous, respiratory, and cardiovascular uh, systems. So you look for signs of faintness, uh, anxiety, you'll have abnormal vital signs, headache, seizures, paralysis, or a coma. Um, you get your uh, CO poisoning, like from the gas in your home, if it's blown out, you, uh, let's say you get that smell of gas in there. Um, hydrogen cyanide, it's that comes from uh, working around a vehicle in, a, in, in an enclosed area. You can get the same carbon monoxide um, issues and hydrogen cyanide, and just not thinking about your your location. I'm not saying that you're not a smart individual. It's just you're so wrapped up in things going. You're like, oh my god, I got this bad headache. Why is it going on? And then it hits you out of nowhere. And then by the time you try to make yourself get out, you may faint or you know uh, go into a, a a faint and then go into a dark coma. So some of the things we can do in the pre-hospital treatment, uh, if you suspect the hydrogen cyanide, not many services I know carry the antidote, but uh, you can, you recognize, identify it, and support a treatment is the best thing you can do. Remove them from the environment. I highly suggest that you don't do that. Somebody else that has the respiratory protection device can do that, but applying, um, just regular oxygen can always benefit the patient. Sometimes it may help you to go ahead and bag the patient just because that their respiratory rate is not adequate enough that you feel that you can help with that supplemental bagging to get their lungs to take that big gasp of oxygen. Uh, chemical burns can occur whenever a toxic substance uh, can contact the body. Uh, most chemical burns are caused by acids or something uh, alkalized. Uh, one of the chemicals I use, it's not, it's not a reactive to skin, but over, if, if you expose it and don't wipe it off, it will cause a chemical burn. It's uh, sodium hypochloride. Um, the same thing as pool shock. It's just, I bought it in 55 gallon drum. So it's a lot, but I mean, I've had like chemical burns on there, pouring gas on yourself on accident or sprinkle, you know, uh, have gas uh, dribble back on you and it stays in contact. It can create a burn too. Uh, always wear face protection anytime you're potentially around chemicals, messing with fuel, uh, sodium hypochloride, because it'll burn. I promise you, I've done that. Bleach. Um, it, those are some of the things that are just straight up chemicals that we know of that can cause those burns. Uh, the type of chemical, what is the concentration? Like, prime thing you can think about is uh, hydrogen peroxide. 
So there's different strengths of hydrogen peroxide. And I'll tell you a story is that 100% hydrogen peroxide is not sold on the market. It is diluted and then sold. Um, but I have actually seen an 18 wheeler full of, of uh, hydrogen peroxide wreck and spill out on an interstate and it ate the concrete. Uh, it literally, like, I mean, it ate the concrete. It didn't just, like dissolve it and wash it away. It was just, it ate probably an eight foot section, probably down two inches over a 12 hour period. So that's, that's a lot uh, in my book. Um, street chemical burns, we talked about this. If this is, if it is a powder, let's brush it off and let's remove it. If it's uh, always, always brush it off. If you can get the clothes off, let's remove the clothing. Get the bulk of that chemical off before you can start uh, trying to decon them. If you, uh, if they don't want to take their shirt off, explain to the, you know, the importance of um, know what that chemical is before you start applying water. Um, what some of the things that you may not think of it can be in your uh, your your shoes, your your socks, your gloves, your jewelry, your underwear. I mean, you've uh, I've had some patients that have chemical exposures that I hold the sheet up for them and I make them get naked, uh, and we wrap another sheet around them so they can have a, something next to them, and we got to get that chemical off. It was a as a top exposure, um, and they they had to get down to to nothing, um, and just. Knowing what that chemical is when you transport that patient into the facility or to the facility will benefit you, the patient, and the hospital a whole lot better. Um, what kind of reactions are you having from it? You need to give it more, enough information because the hospital is probably not going to allow you to enter until they're aware of what chemical that is. So you're not bringing the exposure inside the facility. And try to keep it outside um and then you know they have mass decons at the hospitals or they have at least a, a shower that can be uh, obtained through the outside facility um and they can just use a water hose if it's something that you know it's water soluble because we don't carry enough ambulance and enough water in an ambulance to wash you so um, if you have the fire truck there that would be even better if you know it is a water soluble and you can rinse it that way that's cool uh, let's see here. Take great care to ensure you don't come in contact with the chemical. The patient should properly decon by properly trained personnel. Uh, for liquid chemicals, immediately begin to flush the burned area with a large amount of water. Continuing to flood the area with a gallon of water for 15 to 20 minutes after the patient says the burning pain has stopped. If the patient's eyes have been burned, Hold the eyelids open without applying pressure over the globe of the eye while flooding the eye with gentle stream of water. As with any substance, uh, once the fluid has been contaminated with the chemical, once the fluid has been contaminated with the chemical, collect it and properly dispose of it. Not your job, so don't worry about that. Conduct a proper decontamination prior to loading any patient into the ambulance and begin prior uh, to prior to entering the hospital. So, you, like I said, don't don't track the chemical exposure around because you got to think you're closed in a tight knit area with this patient too that has it on. So, I would like to get them deconned before I leave. Um, that's that's a big personal thing, but at the same time as you. Uh, if it's life over death or life over limb, sometimes you can go ahead and transport them and at least have them closer to the facility. And they may stage you outside of the facility before they bring you in to treat this patient. Uh, let's see, electrical burns may be a result of a high or low voltage electricity. High voltage burns may occur when the utility workers make direct contact with power lines. Uh, ordinary household current can cause severe burns and cardiac dysrhythmias. I can promise you, I've been hit by 110 and 220. They suck and they are not fun. Uh, for electrical, for electricity to flow, there must be a complete circuit between the electrical source and the ground. 
Insulators are any substance that prevents the circuit from being completed. A conductor is any substance that allows a current to flow through it. And the human body is an excellent conductor. Imagine that. If we, if we accidentally mess around with electricity, you can, you can be burned up. I'm sure you have all seen these videos where people make contact on purpose and or by accident, and it just kills them on the spot. Uh, there's nothing really you can do about that. Um, you can potentially knock the patient off of it, of the burning, but you gotta remember, is it gonna cause harm to you when you try to do that? So be cautious about that. The type of electric current, the magnitude of the current and the voltage have effect of serious burn. Yes, and the amperage. Your safety of particular importance when you call to the scene of an emergency accident, never ever attempt to remove somebody from electrical source unless you're trained because you can't walk up there and just grab them that you have to basically football tackle them away from that source so their hands let go uh and the fire service i'm sure you all already know this uh firemen are trained to sweep the wall with the back of their hand so with their glove if something electrocutes them their hand squeezes away from the wall and it doesn't grab it so if they search the wall this way and it hits them, they're gonna grab it. Versus if they're doing with the back of their hand and they come across something, it'll pop them away. That's the, the method to their madness. Uh, burn injury appears where the electricity enters and exits the body. You do have two dangers there. There's a large amount, oh, it tells you, the large amount of deep tissue injuries and the patient may go into cardiac or respiratory arrest. Here's a bad, nasty picture of an electrical burn. Uh, that is uh, entry point. Not real sure where that is. I don't even want to guess, but that's nasty. You can see there's an infection. You can see parts of the hand. I'm just going to say hand. It's starting to heal already, but uh, to the lower part of the screen, you can see how it's already, it's a pretty bad infection. The white stuff is the infection part. Uh, that's just gross. I'm going to let that change on. The biggest thing that we can do here is one, stop the electricity, uh, stop the electrocution. If we can't, we uh, the bad thing is, it's we just have to watch it. Um, is or you don't have to watch it. You can walk away. Um, they're just, and most of the time, if it's a high and high enough, it hits them real fast, and they're in cap. They're out of it before it literally just burns them to pieces. Um, a lot of times, uh, I've been to one electrocution, and that was uh, a guy on a. a he was working for a private electricity company. He didn't have the authority to get up there and throw the, the transformer, but when he pulled it, he he didn't pull it correctly. And when he went to get it again, it popped him and it, he died on the spot. Um, several of our linemen, um, power men, whatever their for proper calls, or I think it's linemen, have died trying to work on power lines. Um, during the hurricanes and tornadoes, these guys are, man, they're amazing. And uh, they just do simple things and it, it can cause a tremendous ripple effect that create uh, havoc on families. Um, we know we've had taser injuries over the years with uh, law enforcement using this. Um, I'm a very avid fan of tasers. Um, I, I fully believe in them. I think they should be used a lot more than what they are, but at the same time as you have to be cautious. Um, once those probe make entry into the body, uh, it's just like a fishing hook probe. It goes in and it's got barbs that stick off on uh, three sides of it. Um, it. It is like a needle when it pierces. It's a hypodermic needle with barbs that stick on there so it doesn't allow it to pull out. Um, when you go to pull them out, you got to put your hand over it. Like if the barb's sticking through here, I want to put my hand over it, grab the top and yank out pretty fast. You just want to hold the skin down so it doesn't try to pull the skin away. Um, it, a lot of times if people are hit with that and they, they fall, like what's supposed to, they can cause uh, head trauma, uh, if they're hit in certain positions or the right way, but at the same time, it's, you, you have to, you can't judge that as you go to pay somebody you're like, oh, sir, scoot three inches to the left, um, part of it, um. Sometimes those, uh, depending on the age or an unknown cardiac emergency, they 
have been recorded to change the uh, rhythm of a patient, but it's not common for that because they they operate on different jewels than what like a uh, AED does. So I mean, you've got to be like an unknown worst case scenario for that to happen. Uh, what is this? Radiation burns. Potential threats include incidents related to the use and transportation of radioactive isotopes. Um, first, to determine if there has been a radiation exposure, and then attempts to determine whether ongoing exposure continues. Um, you have a lot of radioactive sources that travel up and down the interstate uh, highways a lot. Um, Sometimes those are transported uh, in undetectable sources. Now, they at the same time as they have uh, these, these trucks that are carrying dirt that can set off detectors because it's a radioactive and it's natural ground radiation. Um, the government moves um, radioactive stuff around a pretty good bit. They do have it, it is protected, uh, like nuclear waste, it is protected. They have a route plan, they have people watching it. Uh, trust me, heavy artillery watching it and unmarked vehicles a lot of the times. Uh, there's three types of radiation. You have your alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, alpha is the little one, beta is the middle, and uh, gamma is the highest uh, potential uh, for radiation. So alpha can be protected by like normal clothing. Beta, uh, you can stand behind like a fire truck or something, a very thick object. And gamma, you're gonna, have, I think it's like what? It's a certain, like you have to be behind lead that's a certain thickness uh, for the gamma to protect and not come through from the, from the wavelength. Uh, gamma radiation is the one that like makes you grow that third arm and the eye out your back, you know, weird things like that. Uh, most ionized radiation accidents involve gamma, so People that do have uh, exposures to gamma radiations don't pose a risk to others. They're not gonna like radiate it to you. But some of these incidents involving explosions, uh, patients are contaminated with it. They still have to go to the facility, but that's one of those like they need to be known that they had our gamma radiation exposure. Uh, they're gonna meet you out with a, a, a radiation detector. They're going to wave it a wand around and make sure everything's good and detect it that way. Uh, most contaminant, contaminant can be removed by removing the patient's clothing. Um, sometimes they have to they have some other things done, but a lot of it's uh, trapped into like the hair. You can wash it, remove your clothing. They'll burn your clothing. They'll get rid of it that way. But if you have any issues, treat your ABCs to begin with. Uh, Life-threatening issues are going to be your ones. Um, and just wash out those wounds, man. If they got a cut and they've had a due to a gamma exposure, and wash it out. It's the same thing. We we can't not treat the patient because of the radio is the radioactive exposure. We're just more cautious. Uh, be more and more protective of what you're like. Uh, uh, I don't know, but you know, just treat them like anybody else because knowing that it can't come from person to person due to the radiation. It should, it should be a little bit better for you, but you definitely don't want to like flake their clothes off, you know, and be particulates and stuff like that. Uh, obviously, we just said notify the emergency department, uh, limit your duration of exposure. Uh, depending upon the transport distance, um, you may have to uh, stop and spend a few minutes away from them. And then most of the time, if it is a, an exposure, it's going to be at an industrial setting. All of this plans and stuff has been taken care of you just don't know them until you get there because they don't provide that information a lot of times with uh local responders until you get on site because it is some sensitive information uh, about what they have how they have it um and just things like that so it may be a quick education before what you need to do what you're going to do how you're going to do it you're like oh okay sounds like a great idea bruh and handle it. Uh, so, so when we talk about dressings, most of the things we're gonna use when we talk about burns or soft tissue things, is just sterile dressings. Um, this right here, this four by four, is a sterile dressing. It sterilized when it was put in there. Um, it is, it's, 
like sterile gloves, you know, you make sure if you drop it on the ground, use something else. That's not something you want to use. Um, four by fours, four by eights, you know, they have different types of uh, lengths. Make sure if you tape it on, you use, they, we have all different types of tape. And the reason why, like elderly, I don't like using anything but cloth tape. Um, it keeps from pulling on the skin and it's not as tacky. Um, a lot of times I will try not to put tape on them. If I start an IV, uh, I tape it down differently. If I have to tape a, a wound, uh, a dressing to them, I take that much longer because I lay the tape, the tape sticky side up and tape it tighter. You know, I just do different things because it helps the elderly and prevent from their skin tears happening. Um, universal dressings are ideal for coverings. Like we have ABD pads, you have the trauma dressing. So things like that uh, need to be used. You know where they, you need to know where they're at when you start working on your trucks. Uh, knowing your equipment, the location is probably the first thing that you need to be comfortable with because it may be your partner hand, say, hand me this, hand me that, hand me this. And then you're not knowing where it's at is also, it's just, it, it takes time, but it's very important for your patient care. If you're not standing back there going, it's somewhere in here, sir, just hang on. I'll get you some oxygen in a second, you know, but y'all yeah, know what I'm talking about, I hope. Uh, you can use little gauze pads. We have them even out here, even a size of two by twos. Uh, we have them, uh, you know, I can apply a little band aid, depends on what type of cut it is. Um, you can use an occlusive dressing to prevent air. We talked about that. Uh, you can have a Vaseline gauze, they come in a metal container, a little aluminum foil. Uh, you can use plastic. Uh, you can use all that to cover a sucking chest wound, uh, some abdominal viscerations. Uh, penetrating back injuries when you have to be careful of that because you're going to have to lay this patient down face down as you transport them as long as it doesn't come through their abdomen and it's just direct you and you but you need to make sure you can see their face you can maintain their airway or you may just have to adapt and transport this patient completely different than you've ever had before so you can keep an assessment of their airway and remember even when you transport these weird location of injury patients you, you still have to think in the back of your mind, if you have to sit them in the captain's seat of the ambulance, which is still in the back, you need to secure them. Make sure you make them put a seatbelt on. When you put them in the stretcher or on the stretcher and you secure them with the shoulder, the lap belt and the leg belt, that is your, your seat belt team them into the stretcher. Then the stretcher is loaded and locked into a, a locking mechanism in the ambulance. So they're secured. Um, I've seen patients, uh, ambulances get in wrecks to where the patient was on the backboard and secured enough to where it's upside down and they have to go extricate the patient because the straps did their job. They held the patient in place. Um, it's not so much of a fun ride for the, anybody in the truck, but it did its job. That's the most important part. Uh, we talked about uh, roller bandages, soft roller bandages, which is your, your goals. Uh, Triangle bandages uh, you can use uh, to splint an arm. I know that'll be going over in your uh, boot camp. Um, talk about different types of bandages, your types. I just talked to Rob about that. And then uh, self-adherent soft roller bandages are easier to use because it's, it's so much, it takes, you don't have to worry about that other hand that you need to do it. It's right there. Everything's made together and it's, uh, it's just a faster pace of things. Oh, we talk about adhesive tapes. Some people are allergic to adhesive tapes. The same thing with um, latex. We've taken latex out of 90% of the things that we do in EMS and in the hospital setting. So you don't have to worry about that allergy. Um, I remember when I first got in, I built up an, a latex allergy to my hands um, from wearing gloves so much that now we have everything as nitrile gloves, uh, latex-free tape. I'm sitting here looking at uh, nitrile gloves and it says on there, no leg tags. Um, so be careful, you know, make sure that they don't have any of those weird, or if you have leg tags, some reason on a truck, those need to come out and the truck should be wiped down. Um, don't use elastic bandages to like your ACE bandage to hold a, a dressing in place because there's, they're very, they, once you wrap them tight, they, they kind of start 
twisting a little bit and they'll lose their uh, elasticity and won't be as tight. So tape is the best thing um, or a tourniquet if you have to tourniquet in place. I mean like tourniquet that injury. Um, so remember if that energy in, injury swells while you're on the way to the hospital, you may have to loosen that. Um, you may have to be careful to not restrict blood flow. Uh, that's why you want to keep assessments and make sure that it's still in place. Everything's going fine and flowing good. Um, always check the limb for a distal uh, to the bandage so you're not cutting off circulation, you know, unless it's a tourniquet. If you put a bandage on my arm, always reassess it. When you're checking it, feel for a pulse. Make sure I still have a distal pulse. If you put it on my leg, make sure I still have a pedal pulse because I want to know that I put the, the bandage on and potentially cause harm. So, or did I accidentally do it too tight, not knowing? Uh, we talked about air splints the other night. I know that air splints are pretty jam. Um, we use SAM splints out here. SAM splints are uh, a big roll of orange, flexible. It's just like, uh, it's got some very thin metal on the inside, and they're covered in arms. They come in little bitty, like finger bandages, all the way up. I've seen them 12 inches around, like 12 inches wide, and a roll is probably about yay big. Uh, you can use that for the leg. A lot of wilderness uh, have a bunch of those. A lot of your snow uh, rescuers have that because they're small. Um, I use them in my personal bags at home and in my truck to to form the like the rigid cavity in the bag. So they sit a mine up around the top to where if I pull it out, my bag's still rigid, but it's, it's in there around the frame. It's not rolled up, taking space. Uh, that's something that has, because uh, they come in a roll. I mean, I don't know about yay big. And you see that's real pretty big. Um, pretty flexible. I mean, you can mold them to anything. If I use them for a broken arm, I like to roll them in half and then roll them up a little bit. So where the hands in its natural position, and it's holding part of that uh, SAM splint and still coming underneath the arm and I'll wrap the arm uh, with some Curlex or something like that. Uh, you guys are lucky this evening. That is the end of the class. Does anybody have any questions, concerns? This is actually a pretty easy chapter. Um, so y'all should pretty be pretty good on your test this evening. Uh, any questions from anybody? I have a question. Talk to me. So do y'all, well, I say this as do y'all, but as EMTs, are there specific ways like, like in veterinary medicine, like we have what's called like Roberts Jones bandage. Um, it's basically mm -hmm. a specific way that you um, wrap and certain materials that you use, like you have to use like your um, rolled cotton, then uh, rolled gauze, then we would use, of course, vet wrap or elasticon, depending on what it is. Um, are there specific ways like that that you wrap? No, ma'am. We're not really worried about our patients eating the bandages. Um, so I know more in vet in medicine that they sure. and they'll send them home for a, a wrap for a couple of days. So we're we're gonna wrap it and transport them to a higher level of care. You your patient is brought to your facility and then sent back home. So and then yours tend to eat theirs because they want it all. Um, not saying that some of our patients don't do that, uh, but no, it is not. It's one of those. It's not like oh, this is the type A way to roll because there's an injury just because I can tell you how to wrap one specific injury you're going to get out there and see something 100% different period no there's going to be no questions asked so that being the point is it, it's okay to you know wrap it your way uh your patient you may when you look at them you'll be like oh god whoever wrapped that did a horrible job I and mean, you can fix it as long as it's not removing the bandage off of uh of a bleed to you know to check it or look at it just if it's wrapped and it's not bleeding just take it the way it is if it's like when people like have oh he was squirting blood i've got this shirt wrapped around it okay i'm fine with it bro let's go to the hospital 
You don't want to look? Hell no. You can keep that where it's at. We're good. I don't want to wear blood. I don't want it in my truck. We're good, bro. So to answer that around, I know I kept talking, but no, there, it's not. There's not a specific way to wrap an injury. Okay. Yeah, that was my main thing. Ooh. Like, is, is there a specific no way that are required to wrap? Good so. question. No. Not that I've ever been aware of in 20 some odd years. So does anybody have any more? To, uh, any Y'all want to talk about anything outside of this particular class of this uh, lecture? We can talk about whatever. If y'all need to go over something, let's take some time. Uh, we're more than welcome to do whatever you guys would like. If not, that's what most of y'all want. So that is your code for the night. It is the and symbol to, I don't know what that squiggly line is. I just hit it and eight nine. That's your code for this evening. So if nobody has questions, I'm gonna mute my mic for a minute and turn off my camera. I'll be here. So if y'all need anything, uh, just hit me up. I will still be able to hear you folks. Just had to give me a minute and get back to my computer. Uh, all else fails. Y'all have a wonderful evening. Good luck to y'all on your test. Have a blessed weekend. I hope y'all enjoy. I'll be stuck in the Gulf of Mexico. Yay. All right. Safe evening and good weekend to y'all. Have a good night. Good night. I'm sure I'll be contacting you about this next exam soon. No problem. I'll fix it. I promise. I'll take care of you, brother. All right, man. Thanks.